So to begin our final session, it's my pleasure to welcome Georg Selig from the University of Washington. So Georg is well known to people in both synthetic biology and DNA nanotech communities. And today he will present theoretical work that's pertinent to both from the looks of things. So um, Georg, please take it away. Great, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this workshop. And I'm excited to tell you a bit about our work on designing sequences for gene expression control and DNA computing. So I wanna briefly talk about two vignettes. Like in the first part, I wanna talk about engineering um, regulatory sequences like five prime untranslated regions in particular for synthetic biology applications. And then the second part, I wanna, it's very different. I wanna talk about um, essentially doing similarity search in uh, data stored in DNA. And the common theme between these two pretty different uh, uh, topics is that we're going to use high throughput DNA synthesis together with machine learning um, to kind of figure out how we can, or, or to figure out what kind of information we want to encode in these uh, nucleic acids. So let me start by acknowledging the people who did this work, at least in the first part, it's Ban Wang and uh, Paul Sample, two former uh, members of the lab who are just exceptionally creative. And this is also a collaboration with a great team um, at Moderna. So just to motivate this, right, let me show you this slide, which I'm sure everybody here has now heard about um, mRNA vaccines. This actually is information about the vaccine from uh, BioNTech and Pfizer. And what you see here at the top left is a little graph that kind of indicates the different regions that this mRNA has, right? Of course, at the center, there's like the, the S, the spike protein, right? That's the key element of the vaccine. But you can also see that there's a lot of other sequence elements like the lead, the five prime leader and the three prime trailing sequences that have to be included for this messenger RNA to be functional. And I in particular want to focus on these five prime untranslated regions, which are very important for controlling essentially ribosome loading and um, uh, translation efficiency. And in this particular vaccine, the leader sequence comes from a human gene, it's alpha globin, and it has a, a few minor modifications. But I think it's a really interesting question whether this is sort of the optimal choice or whether maybe with synthetic biology, we could find sequences that are even you know, better, maybe more uh, effective at loading ribosomes and, and generating uh, protein. And so what I wanna talk about specifically here is whether we can learn to program 5 prime UTR sequences um, using synthetic biology. And so just very brief reminder, right? Why are 5 prime UTRs important? because they contain a lot of regulatory information like COSAC sequences, upstream start and stop codons, secondary structure that essentially control how efficiently ribosomes are loaded and can initiate translation. And we know a lot about these individual elements, but in some sense, we don't know how to put all of that information together um, in a way that we would be able to predict, you know, quantitatively how much protein we get given a 5 prime UTR sequence. And so that's the goal of this first research project that I wanna tell you about is to build such a predictor, right? And the type of predictor we wanna build is essentially a machine learning model. So it's a st statistical model, not necessarily a biophysical one. And the way we approach this, or in order to make such a model, what we need are examples, right? And one set of examples to look at are human 5 prime UTRs. There's like 45,000 of them, and maybe that would be a good data set but in practice you know if you look at any you know if you look at these sequences there of course it's hard to disentangle the impact of a five prime UTR from the impact of the coding and region and three prime UTRs and in a human genome of course all of these five prime UTRs occur in different contexts maybe the you know the the regulatory role is further sort of hidden by overlap of different uh, regulatory elements etc so my, my point being that even though this looks like, you know, a potentially interesting or certainly is an interesting data set, it may not be ideal for machine learning. Now, what we did instead was to start from a library of completely random 5 prime UTRs, right? So what we did is we took a, a random 50 mer oligo and we stuck it in front of a reporter gene, GFP in this case, but it doesn't even matter. 
And we created a library of 500,000 um, distinct five prime UTRs, right? So it's an order of magnitude more examples than we might have in the human genome. And it, of course, individually, you would argue that maybe a, a specific random sequence is less informative than sort of an evolved biological sequence. But our hypothesis is that most of the regulatory elements that we care for are relatively short, like a start codon or something like that. And that we'll see these elements individually many times in many different contexts in these random sequences. And that by seeing enough of these examples, we can essentially build a model that's predictive, not just for you know other random sequences, but even for actual biological uh, data sets. And of course, what we have here is we have control over context, right? Um, and a very large library, which is which is useful. So then we want to experimentally measure um, so the fitness of these sequences. Basically, in our case, like for each five prime how how good is it at loading ribosomes? And since we want to study translation rather than transcription, we're going to first in vitro transcribe all of these uh, library members to get RNA, and we're going to transfect this messenger RNA into mammalian cells where the RNAs are going to be translated. So these little uh, black things here are supposed to be ribosomes occupying the messenger RNA. And then we're going to perform uh, polysome profiling. So essentially we're going to lyse the cells and put the, ly the lysate into a, a sucrose gradient and spin them down and separate out messenger RNAs by according to how many uh, ribosomes are occupying them, right? So the mRNAs that are heavily occupied will sink down further than the ones that are just you know, occupied maybe by a single ribosome. And then we can essentially, you know, if you, if you now take a sort of an absorbance profile along this uh, y-axis in this left graph and flip it um, horizontally, then you get a profile like this, right, where each peak here corresponds to, for example, this is corresponds to one ribosome or mRNAs occupied with one ribosome, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to collect each of these fractions individually and we're going to sequence them. And we're going to ask how often we see a specific messenger RNA in each fraction. And this is just one messenger RNA, like UTR1 might have a profile like this. So, for example, we've seen it a lot here in you know, the, the fraction corresponding to one or two ribosomes. And from this measurement, we can get something like the mean ribosome load for for this sequence, and of course, this is massively parallel, right? So we get this information for all 500,000 sequences in our uh, library. And so at the end of this experiment, we have the following data. We have 500,000 sequences, and associated with those sequences, we have 500,000 fitness measurements. And then we can take these data, and we can train essentially our favorite model, right? Then we could take a linear regression model where the features are short sequence elements. Here, the model that worked well was actually a, a convolutional neural network. And I'm not gonna show you much about the, the architecture, but I just wanna make the point that the, the predictor works really well on a held out test set, right? So we took about 20,000 sequences that we never saw, that the network never saw in training, and it is capable of predicting how many ribosomes each of these sequences loads with very high accuracy. And it's also important to, to make the point that what we're measuring is really protein production. So we took some specific sequences, or actually the folks at Moderna did, and measured GFP associated with the particular UTR. And you can see that there's a good correlation between the, the mean ribosome load that we measure in this polysome profiling experiment and the GFP produced from these identical sequences, right? So this is really measuring protein production. Now, what we also did is to synthesize another library with 40,000 or so elements where we took human 5 prime UTR fragments and tested them experimentally in the same way that we did the random fragments. And then we took the model that was trained just on these random sequences and used it to predict how these human 5 prime UTRs would, would influence ribosome loading. And, and again, you can see that the, the model trained on random sequences does very well at predicting these human evolved uh, sequences, including variants that, were, that are associated with disease. Um, 
I also want to point out that the, the model that we're using here um, is available as a, as a very nice web tool. You can design sequences, you can test the impact of variants, you can take the five prime UTRs from you know, the various mRNA vaccines and you can stick them into this uh, tool to figure out how good they are or whether you could make sequences that are better than that were used um, by Pfizer and Moderna. But now I also um, want to tell you a little bit about how we can actually use this model now to design sequences, right? That was sort of the, the point. And the simplest algorithm that you know you can come up with essentially shown here. So you start, you take some initial sequence, you calculate the fitness using the model, makes a prediction for the MRL. Then you make a mutation, for example, switch this A here to a C, feed that mutated sequence to the model again, you get a new fitness F prime. And you know, if your goal is to make the maximal amount of or produce the maximal amount of protein, then you would keep the mutation if you know F prime is larger than F. So the fitness of the mutated sequence is higher, or you would reject it if not. And you can iteratively do this over and over again until you kind of arrive at something that you consider the best, or so until until your approach sort of converges to something. Right? And so we did that. In practice, with a few hundred sequences, we synthesized them again and then tested them using the exact same polysome profiling workflow. And I just want to show you the results of that. So in this graph, the goal was to design sequences with defined mean ribosome load. So the, the little gray bars here, that's the designed target. So we designed you know, the intended target is three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, ribosomes loaded um, on this sequence. And I think we did, I forget if it was 10 or 100 sequence per target. And then the red bars are the measurements, right? And you can see broadly that the measured um, MRL aligns very well with the designed MRL. So kind of suggesting that this sort of design approach actually really allows you to, to quantitatively design five prime UTRs um, for a particular target of, of protein production. Um, now, I also want to make the point that the particular design approach that I showed you here is not super efficient. Basically, you know, just keep querying the predictor over and over again is computationally intensive. And also, the, the, this approach of doing single mutations you know, has a tendency of getting stuck in sort of local minima. And I just want to highlight couple papers from the lab that were really led by Johannes Linder, an exceptional grad student in the lab, on developing algorithms for making this design process much faster. So for example, on the left, he came up with, an, with a new or a, a sped up version of activation maximization, which is essentially trying to directly optimize the input by gradient ascent. And on the right, this deep exploration network is a type of generative model that can spit out sequences uh, for a given target that are both high quality and, and diverse. Um, but with that, I kind of that was sort of the end of this first vignette on designing sequences for synthetic biology. And now I want to kind of switch gears and move to a totally different topic that again is kind of connected to the first one simply by the fact that we're using high throughput libraries of synthetic oligos and machine learning. And in this case, I want to talk about similarity search in DNA. And I'll tell you what that is in a, in a second. But before that, again, I want to acknowledge the people who actually did this work and kind of conceived of it. So that's really um, Kelly B, who's the, the lead computational scientist um, on this work, Yuan Chen, who uh, did the experimental work, and then Karin and Luis, who are leading this large uh, DNA data storage uh, jointly between Microsoft and the University of, of Washington. So for those of you who you know, maybe haven't heard about DNA data storage, the idea of DNA data storage is that we want to take advantage of the, the very high information density of DNA and the potential very high durability of DNA to store digital information, right? And sort of deal with this problem that the amount of digital information in the world is growing exponentially and that data centers you know, take up an enormous amount of, of, of resources. 
And the basic workflow of DNA data storage is just that we take some information that's encoded in binary, we translate it into a quaternary code made of GCs, A's and T's, we synthesize the corresponding DNA, and then we stick that DNA you know, into, we preserve it in some way, maybe in the simplest case, we put it in a freezer. And then of course, at some point, we might want to access this information again, or what I want to talk about here specifically is we may not want to access the entire uh, store at the same time, but we want to extract particular bits of information or particular files from this uh, stored information. Once we've molecularly you know, retrieved the sequences, the, the molecules we care for, we can sequence them and translate them back to electronic uh, format. And the, again, the key thing I want to talk about is this information retrieval. And so now I'm going to go through these key steps a little more slowly. So let's say we have an image and that image is encoded, of course, as a binary file. And the first observation we're going to make is that, you know, when we store information in DNA, at least the way we do it is we're working with synthetic oligos that have finite length, right? And so we have to take a file and we have to break it up into shorter fragments that individually can encode it on you know, one oligo each. And of course, we also have to add some additional information that kind of keeps track of the ordering of these oligos within the file, since it's not just a single concatenated sequence. Then we do some sort of encoding, and there's lots of, of tricks here um, to translate this binary information to quaternary information. And often in the encodings, the key element is to kind of do it in such a way that we kind of that it's that uh, um, that the encoding is robust to errors that occur during synthesis and, and sequencing. We also, and this is important, append essentially PCR primers to the to the to these file to these oligos. And these PCR primers, you can kind of think of as a file name, effectively, that allow you, you know, so for example, here, it's the file airplane.jpg that allow you to potentially retrieve that file if you know the name. And these are shared between all the oligos mapping to a single file. So then we can synthesize these oligos and we can, of course, store them in a test tube. And in practice, you know, more often than not, this test tube or, or whatever storage device will contain many different files with many different file names. And so the first, so, so now we're coming kind of to the interesting part, which is like, okay, if we have many files stored in the same test tube, how can we retrieve, you know, just the image we care for? And of course, the, the way I set it up, the answer, to, one answer to this is already pretty clear. Well, if you know the file name, like if you know the, the file you're looking for, and you know what the corresponding meaning, you know what the corresponding primers for this file are, well, then you can do a PCR reaction, right, that selectively amplifies only those uh, oligos that correspond to the file you care for. And then if you sample the amplified pool, you know, mostly you're going to get the oligos you care for. You can sequence those back and you can, you know, recover the image. And as of as of now, we've probably you know showed that this is quite feasible with you know up to tens of millions of oligos. Um, we've stored about one gigabyte of data and been able to recover you know specific files from this stored uh, data reliably. Um, but now I want to kind of talk a little bit of a more interesting way of retrieving information, which is. Very commonly, right, if you even now look up something on your computer, you don't actually know the file name that you're looking for, but you want to you want to search your computer or the Internet based on some sort of on, on content, right? So you want to do content based retrieval. This could be that you type some description of, a, of an image in order to retrieve an image, or it could be that you have an image and you want to recover similar images as shown in this example here. And you know, to do this naively, you would say, well, maybe this is quite simple. What you could do. So, sorry. 
what you what you what naively what you might hope is that like images that are similar also have similar uh, DNA encodings, right? And then what you could do is basically take you know reverse complement one of these images and sort of use the sequences to pull out the other image or or similar images, right? Now there's sort of two issues with this naive approach. The first one is that you know, in practice, images that are visually similar will not have similar encodings. I mean, you can easily imagine that if one image is a JPEG and the other one's a, a PNG, their binary files will look very different, right? And moreover, in, in the encoding step, like going from binary to quaternary information, we actually on purpose kind of scramble the information uh, because that's useful for, for error correction, right? So. Sequences of visually similar images will not a priori be similar. And then moreover, as you may recall, right, each image is stored on many different oligonucleotides. And so essentially, you know, even, even if it were true that images are similar, it might be hard to pull down. You'd have to make many, many different probes to actually pull down the image um, completely. Okay, so that naive approach doesn't work. But what we do is actually not very far removed from this naive approach. But the observation we, we work with is that rather than looking at the image itself, we can look at a feature vector. So the features here might be edges, oriented edges in the image, or something about you know the, the colors that occur in the image, etc. And for each of these, each image that we care for, you know, we have this 4,000 or so dimensional feature vector, and feature vectors of similar images actually are similar. So that's on the right-hand side, this is kind of a, a 2D visualization of, of a feature vector space where you can see that images that are kind of similar are close together in this feature vector space. Okay, and so now the idea is that we, instead of encoding the image, we'll encode the feature vectors to DNA, and we'll do it in such a way that similar feature vectors get mapped to similar DNA sequences. And so, so this is just making this point again, right? So what we want to do eventually is we want to have one oligo per image. And we want to, you know, then be able to take a query image. So that's, we take the feature vector oligo, we just reverse complement it. And then we use that image essentially as a probe to pull out images that are similar. And that works as long as Similar images, you know, have similar sequences as shown at the top, and different images have different sequences. Okay. Now the question is kind of where does this encoding come from? And again, this is a place where we sort of use machine learning. So we start um, here again with images and associated feature vectors, and then we want to train a sequence encoder that essentially takes these images as inputs and spits out um, one hot encoded DNA sequences. Okay. Now, a priori, the encoder doesn't know, before it's trained, it doesn't really know how to make good sequences. But what we're going to do with these two sequences is we're going to send them to a hybridization predictor that predicts how well they stick to one another. And that's its own, it's a, a separate neural network, but you can think of it as just something like NUPAC. And that predictor essentially tells us the yield of the reaction, like how strongly do you know the image, one image bind to the reverse, does one image bind to the reverse complement of the other image? Okay. Now, in addition, we also of course know how similar the images are in image space, right? Specifically, we can look just at the Euclidean distance between the feature vectors. And for our purposes, we're gonna sort of subjectively just decide that if the Euclidean distance is shorter or is less than 75, then we're going to call these images similar. And if it's larger, we're going to call them not similar. Okay, so we have that information. And so we can use that information together with the predicted yield to kind of um, build an error function, right? And what we want to do is we want to minimize the, the yield so for um, or maximize the yield for similar documents, and we want to minimize the yield for dissimilar documents, right? So we kind of do this by just showing 
the encoder a bunch of examples and eventually the encoder will learn how to make sequences that, that match this, this objective. So once we have our encoder, we can now of course go in and we can take an image database. And in, in this project, we took, I think, uh, Open Images v4, which I think is a database with 9 million or so images in it. And out of those 9 million, we encoded 1.6 million images or their corresponding feature vectors in DNA. And so each feature vector in this case corresponding to a single uh, um, AD nucleotide long oligo. And then we synthesize those 1.6 million of distinct oligos on an array. And so we have our encoded and synthesized database. And now we can essentially query this database with query images. And these are sort of three uh, different, I think the building at the top is in, in Taipei, a cat and then some Lego sushi. That's kind of a harder query. We of course also encode these images as as DNA, just a single strand, and reverse complement them, attach them to uh, magnetic beads, and then use these queries, so mix the queries with the database and use the query to pull out sequences from the database, right? And what we're going to do then is we're going to count, we're going to sequence these, the retrieved um, molecules, right? And we're going to get counts, like how often do I see a particular sequence um, in my sequencing run. And I also know from the get-go how similar a particular image is to my query, right? Because I know what the, the database is, look, looks like. And so the hope, of course, is that if I plot, you know, that, that if I look at images that have, that I see a lot, where I see, you know, that I sequence many copies of, that those images are, are similar and images that I don't see as much are less similar on average to my query. And so again, this is on the on the x-axis here, I'm sort of showing the actual distance in the, uh, in the feature vector space. And on the y-axis, I'm gonna look at different read thresholds. And so this green dashed line is just indicating the similarity threshold of 75, okay? So now I can, again, look for this example, I can first look at all the images that I see at least once in uh, my experiment, that there's about 300,000 out, out of the 1.6 million that I, I get a read from at the current sequencing coverage. And they have a certain average distance from the target, right? Now, if I look at images that are more deeply covered, like 300 reads per image, I can see that this distribution shifts to the left and I recover now more similar images. And as I go to deeper and deeper coverage, um, Overall, you know, I get more and more similar images um, as, as I would hope. Um, and I also want to make the, very briefly the point that the method of retrieval, you know, gives you, if you actually look at the most similar images retrieved for each threshold, of course, they all look quite similar to the target. Um, and I also want to make the point that this retrieval method actually works about as well or, or you know, comparable to the performance that you get from electronic retrieval, right? So this is quite remarkable that we have a molecular computation here done at scale, like over millions of images with a performance, at least in terms of what you get back, the quality of the results you get back, that's somewhat comparable to what you get in, in purely uh, state-of-the-art algorithms developed by like Google, the Googles and Facebooks of, of the world, right? And so with that, I just want to kind of, you know, remind you again of what I what I talked about. So in the first part of the project, I kind of used machine learning and high throughput uh, DNA synthesis and sequencing to build predictive models of, of gene regulatory elements. And, you know, I've showed you this example of five prime UTRs, but we've also done this for, for splicing and alternative pollination and other contexts. And then in the second Part of the talk, I, I gave you an example of performing, of using um, machine learning and, and high throughput synthesis to do uh, massively parallel image search in data stored in DNA. And I already acknowledged, you know, many the, the people who actually did these projects, but I just want to end by also kind of acknowledging everybody else in the lab 
um, and our sponsors. So thank you very much for your attention.